distinguished guests, dear speakers of the conference, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear participants of the Young Leaders Forum, on behalf of the Anta Jozsef Knowledge Center and Director Peter Antal, I would like to warmly welcome you to the second day of the Team Budapest Conference. Thank you very much for your interest in the future. Thank you for your curiosity and your openness to innovation, technology, and digitalization. Do you use any smart solutions? Your answer are definitely yes. Do you know how often you check your emails? Do you know exactly how often open your social media accounts daily? Do you know how many times check your smartphone? 47, 50. That's how many times the average consumer is likely to check his or her smartphone today in the US. And I think we have a similar number in this region as well. Based on FB stati statistics, each visit to Facebook lasts 10 or 12 minutes, and users spend at least one hour per day on Facebook. The, the first iPhone, which is a smartphone, was introduced only 12 years ago. Gmail is 15 years old. What? Only 15 years old, it's incredible. AI boomed in the first decades of the 21st century when machine learning was successfully applied to many problems in academia and industry due to the presence of powerful computer hardware. Smartphone, smart cities, smart home, smart car, smart watch. The past two decades saw the emergence of the modified meaning of the word smart, a concept that is hard to define, but is always connected with notions of automation, user customization, and adaption. Making things smart is thus designed to make our lives more comfortable, more cost-efficient, and maybe cheaper, greener, and healthier too. But we need to emphasize innovation is not only about technology, but the way we see it developed and the way we adapt to it ourselves. The Team Budapest Conference is organized annually by the Anta Jozsef Knowledge Center, an institution committed to, committed to regional cooperation. The aim of Team Budapest is to connect us to the future as the challenges of digitalization require answers. For this reason, the first conference in the series looked at the effects of social innovation, while the second one revolved around the medical industry, the third around transportation, and this year we are looking at smart cities. And we are only just getting started. Over the past three years, Think Budapest has boasted 2,000 participants and 200 internationally recognized speakers from 20 countries. I certainly consider it is important for the conference to reflect the interest of Hungary. Our goal is to bring stakeholders together, people who can cooperate in the field of education and when we ask where it all gets rewarding, it's at this point, when a long-term cooperation begins to take shape. We hope when we talk about Team Budapest Conference, future thinkers, visionaries, those who care for the future, company leaders, academics, and political decision makers want to be here to share their ideas, knowledge, and research the data about the future. In the long run, we hope to convince people to travel from afar, especially to attend the conference, and to turn it into a brand strong enough to become a buzzword globally. The event enjoys the support of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade of Hungary and the International Visegrad Fund. Mr. Peter Sijarto, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade of Hungary, 
is our main patron from the very beginning. The guest country of the 2019 event is the United Kingdom due to its economic and scientific interest in the Visegrad cooperation, as well as the fact that it has been in the forefront of championing a technology-intensive economic growth model. Take a tour in our Startup Expo side event in the lobby and explore the data-driven digital solutions from the UK and Hungary as well. Now let me thank you for our key partners' support and thank you for our great keynote speakers, panel speakers, who participate and share their vision about smart homes, smart cities, and e-democracy. And now, let the conference begin. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Veronica. Next, please welcome to the stage Matthew Evans, Executive Director at Tech UK. Thank you very much. Ladies, gentlemen, ministers and emissaries, good morning. My name is Matthew Evans and I'm Director of Markets at Tech UK. And it gives me great pleasure and I'm really honored to help open day two of the Think Budapest conference. I'd like to thank the organizers, the Antal Yosef Knowledge Center, as well as the British Embassy for putting together such a relevant and packed agenda today. We are extremely pleased for the UK to be just the second host country for this conference, which is quickly establishing itself as a key regional innovation event. Tech UK is a trade association facing the tech sector in the UK. We represent the countries that are helping to define the world that we will live in tomorrow. More than 900 member companies uh, collectively employ over 700,000 people in the UK. That's about half of the tech sector uh, jobs in the UK. These companies range from leading FTSE 100 companies, and you will hear from some of them today, as well as to new innovative startups. Our counterpart in Hungary is ISVZ, and our CEO, Julian David, is Vice President of Digital Europe, which is a trade association across the EU and indeed beyond. It's great to see such a diverse audience from all corners of Europe here. Digitization and AI offers us great opportunities as well as presenting us incredibly difficult challenges. Given the global nature of digital technologies, it is essential that countries come together to collaborate how to maximize these benefits as well as finding a way of overcoming the barriers. The UK has a close relationship with Hungary and the V4 group, be that over 100,000 Hungarians living in the UK, and to be honest, when I did this research, uh, there were quite a few other higher numbers that I could have chosen. Uh, the UK is the sixth uh, largest investor in Hungary. Uh, all that Hungary's exports to the UK have trebled since the turn of the millennium. I think we're also both clear Hungary and the UK, that digitization represents the future of the global economy. The UK has some impressive strengths in this area. We're, the, uh, we're Europe's largest software market, the largest e-commerce market, and the largest IT services market. Last year, KPMG ranked us as the third most promising market for innovation, disruption, and technology breakthroughs after the US and China. We also have seen a record level of venture capital investment in the UK tech sector more than Germany, France, Spain, and Ireland combined. We're really keen to help others understand uh, what has worked for us in building these strengths, as well as what's gone wrong, because to be honest, that's often the most interesting stuff. It's evident that the UK and Hungary are also united in the belief that nations which grasp the power of the fourth industrial revolution offers uh, us will be far more successful going into the 21st century. Data is fueling that revolution, and AI lies at the heart of it. Now, I'll make a confession. Uh, I am not an engineer. Uh, so when I say AI, it means everything from deep learning, machine learning, and any other buzzwords that I haven't heard about, but I'm sure uh, I'll pick up today. But what AI offers us is the ability to expand the computing power available to us. Just as previous industrial revolutions offered us the ability to expand our physical capacity, 
given us the tools to produce new physical products, the current revolution expands the total computing power available to us. Used well, it offers the, the ability to gain new insight, formulate new products and services, and assist us in solving some of our thorniest social problems. By one estimate, it will add over £230 billion to the UK economy by 2030. Such is its importance to the UK that it is just one of four pillars of the industrial strategy uh, in the UK. I know that Hungary's uh, AI coalition is also starting to deliver real tangible results. For us, there are two elements of AI being used well. First, it is only as good as the data that is being utilized. There are several aspects to this, but put simply, if a company is using paper-based in inventory logs, then the world's best solution to logistics, uh, AI solution to logistics, is only gonna have a limited impact. Digitization is a necessary step in making use of AI, whilst, of course, AI also increases the benefits of digitization. This represents a virtuous circle, but taking the first step on that path to digital transformation, be it for private sector companies or public sector, still remains hard. Now, I'll return to the issue of data in a moment. As I said, we know that digital transformation is easy to say, hard to do. And the tech sector, of course, is continually undergoing disruption and needs to transform itself to stay relevant. You only have to look at some of the amazing startups outside to see the amount of innovation that is coming forward. So whilst the tech sector, I think, can share some real lessons, we know that in order to get the most out of digital transformation, we need to better understand some of those sectors which we are disrupting and which we are helping to transform. And that is why I think collaboration is absolutely key. Secondly, if businesses and citizens are going to offer up their data, then they need to have trust, both in how that data is being utilized and in the way in which decisions are being taken by an AI solution. Building that trust requires three things, transparency, responsibility, and an ethical framework. In the UK, we focused on all of those areas, but in particular, we've identified developing an ethical framework for AI as a potential competitive advantage. If we are to succeed though, then we will need to move the conversations about AI ethics and digital ethics more generally out of conference rooms such as this, as nice a room as it is, and into the boardrooms. It has to go to that next level. And this isn't just about AI. It could be about the privacy concerns that the Internet of Things or new biometrics technology are bringing about. But we need to build that trust if we are to take advantage of the tools that the Fourth Industrial Revolution offers us. The UK has set up a number of bodies in this area uh, to look at how we develop that ethical framework, including the Centre for Digital Ethics and Innovation, and the and innovation is really important. This is not about stifling innovation, it's actually about enabling it. And the Ada Lovelace uh, Institute. And I'd urge you to look out for some of the publications, the frameworks, the reports that these bodies are now starting to deliver. They're starting to deliver tangible and actionable tunes, uh, tools that can bring the ethical debate to life. My marketing team would kill me if I didn't plug our own Tech UK conference on digital ethics in December. If you'd like to attend, come and see me after this speech. That out of the way. Let me now turn back to data. And for those of you who are betting, we're 25 minutes in and I'm about to say Brexit. In fact, I wrote most of this speech last week and I didn't know whether to mention Brexit uh, or wait until last night or this morning given the pace of change. Now, as an individual, the heartstrings twinged a little bit as I went through passport control and down the EU citizens uh, lane, which, to be honest, was quicker as well. But for business, there's a, there's a more tangible and, to be honest, very dangerous issue for us uh, as we face Brexit, and that concerns data. Overall, the UK accounts for 11.5% of global data flows, an incredible amount. 
75% of these are with the EU. And as we've already touched upon, data is absolutely central to the fourth industrial revolution and our future economy. Indeed, it's quite hard to quantify how much economic benefit it delivers, given that it's hard to imagine the current or future economy without free flow of data. Tech UK have been clear, as has the whole UK tech sector, uh, that the best way to ensure frictionless data transfers continue is through mutual adequacy agreements between the UK and EU in a post-Brexit world, whatever form that takes. Adequacy, adequacy agreements allow personal data to be transferred between third countries and the EU once a domestic uh, assessment of the data protection laws have taken place. Earlier in the year, we signed a joint paper with Zipsy, the Technology Trade Association in Poland, which sets out the problem of using anything other than an adequacy, adequacy agreement, as well as making two recommendations for the European Data Protection Board in the event of a no deal. They were to confirm the validity of standard contractual clauses. Uh, for the lawyers in the room, I imagine you will have been focusing on these quite a bit in order to provide clarity and confidence to business that they can use these clauses to transfer personal data from the EU to the UK. The second was to consider encouraging data protection authorities in the EU to implement regulatory forbearance to give EU companies more time to provide alternative mechanisms to transfer data uh, and also allow that time for the UK and EU to reach an adequacy agreement. We know that Brexit will cause probably quite a lot of disruption, but given that data is so critical to the strength of both our and Hungary's economies, we must find a way to continue to allow this to flow freely across the continent. But let us not end on Brexit. AI digitization offers us incredible op opportunities. Now today we can see it transforming business processes, manufacturing, and yes, freeing up humans from more routine tasks. And that is probably where the business case for AI needs to start. There is nothing wrong in thinking small in terms of how you develop and apply digital technologies. But let's also think big. Think about the advances that it can help us unlock in healthcare. In the UK, trials have shown that AI is now able to identify eye conditions to the same accuracy as the best doctors in the world. So everyone using that tool now has the best that medicine has to offer. And they are actually starting to even go beyond that level of accuracy. Think about the potential benefits that AI can offer us in the challenges facing our cities. AI-driven models are already offering policymakers more data on potential solutions to issues such as air quality, to social care, to helping us deal with our aging populations. Think about what AI and automation can bring in terms of autonomous vehicles, the social benefits that they could bring in terms of mobility for those who are unable to drive or access traditional public transport. So yes, there are challenges both in the digital and uh, in the political world that we live in, uh, but I think by collaborating, by taking responsibility, uh, we can overcome these challenges and let's not forget, whilst we do so, the prizes that we are aiming for. Thank you again for inviting me to speak today. I look forward to meeting many of you. Uh, please do find me if you are interested in learning more about Tech UK. And I look forward to hearing more about the opportunities that digital technologies uh, offer us, both in the UK and in Hungary. Thank you very much. Thank you.